My man, David, how are you doing today? Hey, fine, Andy, how are you? I'm doing good, I'm doing good. I wanna welcome everybody uh, to this webinar that we're here, having here for the Post and Courier of Columbia. We're here to talk about probably some of the biggest news that I think we've had in Columbia this year outside of COVID. Obviously, that's been the big story, but you know, uh, for those of us trying to maybe put COVID behind us a little bit for just a little while, um, you know, we've had the uh, the big coaching change uh, that you know take up our uh, you know take up our time, take up our attention. Hopefully, uh, was a little bit of turkey talk, and we'll be obviously the talk uh, uh, when folks uh, are around the, around each other for the holidays, maybe zooming each other for the holidays. So, David and I are here to talk a little bit about how this story came together, how we were. Uh, the first uh, uh, reporters to confirm uh, the hiring of Shane Beamer. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of where we think the program's headed, uh, where things are going to go. We're going to obviously also answer some of your questions uh, as well. So uh, this is, uh, you know, feel free also to, uh, to, uh, to send us some questions, but we had some submitted uh, for folks who registered. So I'm going to start off, I'm going to talk to Dave, and I want to let him talk a little bit first about what that night was like in Lexington, Kentucky when um, soon after the game, soon after the final whistle, uh, we got word uh, that there had been a, co that, that, that uh, we had, uh, we had a new coach. Well, thanks Andy. Uh, yeah, it, it was an interesting night because um, a few weeks before at the Ole Miss game, that's an eight hour drive from Oxford to Columbia and I spent every minute of it on the phone. Uh, you know, you kind of start hearing some whispers, they turn into smoke. And of course, by the time I got back in Columbia, 30 minutes later, Will Muschamp was fired. So I knew that they weren't going to make an announcement of a new coach before the Kentucky game. Um, but I knew that that Sunday coming back from Lexington, it was likely to be another Ole Miss experience. So I go to the game, it's a 7.30 kick, uh, you know, not to offend anybody here, but you knew what was gonna happen during the game. So my game story was done after the first quarter. I just needed to fill in the final score when it was over. You know, South Carolina was just beaten up, depleted, had no chance of winning. So I said, okay, Kevin Harris got the 1,000-yard mark. All right. And, 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 and David, just to just, just remind folks, at that point, the Gamecocks, let alone had been hit by, by some injuries, had been set by folks who decided to opt out, as well as some folks who had been hit by COVID. Well, it was com all that combination. They only dressed 53 scholarship players for that game, uh, Andy. And, you know, you just can't win like that. But, you know, kudos to them for electing to still play. Uh, but they knew that the result probably wasn't going to be good. So earlier that day, uh, I believe I talked with you, Andy, and we had confirmed that it was down to five finalists. And I'll mm -hmm. a story for the Sunday paper that would say, okay, here's the five finalists. Here's their pluses, their minuses, and when the decision could happen. I was expecting it probably Sunday night, Monday press conference. Well, right well, before but, but, yeah, yeah, but I mean, one of the complications was that the Billy Napier interview was that day. Right, it was going to happen Saturday afternoon. So we knew it was like, well, nothing's gonna happen until after that interview, it was gonna be late afternoon. So we probably weren't gonna know anything Saturday night. So right before the game started, one of the finalists, Scott Satterfield from Louisville, uh, pulled his name out, you know, put out a statement on social media, uh, said, you know, I'm not pursuing any jobs, which is coach speak for, they didn't offer it to me. So you kind of cross him off. And I, I was going with the other four candidates and I knew, from previous, you know, reporting and from talking with my sources, it was Shane Beamer or Billy Napier, and Napier had yet to interview. So I'm typing away on that story. I'm probably about, I don't know, 15 minutes from being done. The game is about six minutes from being done, and I'm getting everything ready to file it. And all of a sudden it pops on Twitter, Billy Napier has put out a statement that says, okay, I'm going to stay at Louisiana. I'm excited to what we're going to do. Now, already having known that those were the top two candidates, and Shane Beamer was going to say yes. It's like, that's it right there. That's probably going to be it. Napier's out. Beamer's the guy. I hit up one of my top sources saying, okay, it looks to be happening. Let me know as soon as you have. And I started tearing up my story saying and writing the first draft of Shane Beamer's new football coach. And, 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 for the, and, and real quick, for folks who don't know, we, when we get information like this, when we kind of get some, 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 some idea, we try to pre-write as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the news happens, we push the button and, and we get it online. There you go. We're not going to put it out either that it's just going to be, well, we expect or this could happen. It's going to be, here's the facts. Here's what's going on. So I told you, I, I hit up one of my sources. Probably a minute later, he called me 
which is not normal. You know, normally we, we go by text messages. I'm in the press box. I'm surrounded by other USC riders on the beat. I said, uh, hold on. Went to the back, picked up the phone. I said, what is it? And he said, yeah, it's on. They're going to go pick him up in the morning from Oklahoma and bring him back so we meet the team. I said, are you sure? You have to be pot. He said, yes, absolutely. I've got the name and everything's going on. I said, okay, great. We're going with it. Said, right. Made it. Uh, Andy hit me up right then and said, hey, a uh, buddy of mine just reached out and said, it's, it's Beamer. I said, I know. I got it. We're on it. And I think right after Bruce Feldman from The Athletics said, Shane Beamer's expected to be named the new head coach. We had our story up that said Shane Beamer's the new head coach. He, he'll be here in the morning in Columbia, and he'll probably meet the team in the afternoon, and they'll probably have a press conference Monday. And, of course, we get back to town. Shane's already there. He's met the team. Press conference was on Monday. Exactly. And getting back to, to what happened on, on that on that Saturday night, you know, obviously we want to get as many sources as we can to confirm these things. I mean, I, you know, it's nice. I mean, David's source, solid. We probably could have just gone with that. Getting a second source was nice uh, on top of that. So while, 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 you know, people are saying he's expected to be hired as the coach, we were able pretty much within minutes to say, nah, it, it's a done deal. He's, he's got it. So we were, that's why we were able to kind of get it first. We had good sourcing on that and we felt secure in, in, in being able to do that. And certainly, obviously, uh, uh, you know, what we saw the next couple of days turned out, turned out to be true. And again, it was because we had sort of understood uh, as, as the crowd got whittled down, who was it going to be down to and then being ready to rock and roll and push the button and get you the news as quickly as we can. And that's what it means. Well, David, I'm just for, just for folks who may not know, how long have you been covering Gamecock Athletics now? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> off and on since 1996. Uh, there were some breaks in there. I covered uh, preps in Florence for a couple of years, did a lot of other uh, local colleges, including Clemson when I was in Rock Hill for four years. But off and on since 96. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and really and, since 2008. And, and the only time you ever were, were the second best basketball writer uh, on the Gamecock beat was a couple of years I covered Gamecock basketball yeah, and well. some other sports. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you, and, you can uh, be on the announcement of Frank Martin, but I had all the stuff before that. My no, stupid, no, 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 my, no. my stupid self who went to go take a shower that morning when, when a when a board member called me and said, "Hey, it's your guy." By the time I, 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 I had, had a, you I, had, I had a camera in there, I knew when you were going to be on, you were going to be <laughs> occupied. So. But yeah. not in the shower, just now when you were not in the room. Good, good no, lesson. That's, Never that's, take a shower when you're expecting an important call. It, exactly, exactly. It is what it is. But no, I, I've, I covered the Gamecock Athletics for a couple of years, uh, about, uh, you know, in, in uh, 10 and 11, uh, pretty much before I started covering politics. But I've covered the university, uh, so the other side of it, uh, the administrative side of it, uh, since 2012. So, um, you know, between us, we've uh, we got a lot of history. And, of course, you're a grad. <laughs> Uh, I'm married to a grad, which means I get to hear a lot about uh, about things, including our coverage. Um, so there we go. It's, it is what it is. Um, but, you know, that's that's kind of how, how we did it. So, um, uh, you know, let me ask you this. And, and is that people are going to look at look at Shane Beamer and they see uh, uh, someone who wanted to be here, someone who had been an assistant here, obviously had the support of these of, of the Spur era players behind him. But what are the main qualifications you, you've heard, you understood, is the reason why USC uh, wanted, to, uh, wanted, to make, wanted to put him in charge of the team? Uh, exactly, uh, Andy. You know, it, it really does speak that he wanted to be here. And really, as soon as uh, Will Muschamp was fired on November 15th, um, I, as I said, I had just gotten back from the Ole Miss road game. And, you know, coaching searches go quick. You don't ever want to have to do them, but when you're pushed into them, things start happening quick. So I'm dead tired. I'm exhausted. I just laid down to bed probably after the initial, you know, must champs gone and found that story. Right then my phone rang, and it was followed by another. Two people the first night called and said, here's who's going to be interested in it. Here's who they're looking at. And Shane Beamer was always going to be on that list. He had already reached out to people and said, I'm interested, I'm ready to go, uh, let me know what I need to do. So he was a guy, and you can go back and check out the hot board that we published the next day, Shane Beamer's the first name on it. Um, it really does speak to say, if you have somebody who's familiar with USC and what their operations are, what their facilities are that knows the people, knows the town, that really does help. Nothing against I, somebody. I, and knows the history, you know, to yes. a certain degree. And, the expert, and, the understanding and obviously of, being of here they when, when they were winning some games, that, that yeah. helped too. So wow. Shane was always a guy that they were looking at. He's young, he's energetic. The only knock on him was that he doesn't have any head coaching experience. 
and he doesn't have any experience being an offensive or a defensive coordinator. But what kind of helped overcome that, one, as we said, he'd been here, and two, he had learned under so many other coaches during his career, starting with his father, Frank Beamer, progressing to Philip Fulmer at Tennessee, progressing to Steve Spurrier, progressing to Kirby Smart at Georgia, and now under Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma. So they knew that how, the experience that he had, and when he presented his plan of saying, here's what I'm going to do, here's how I'm going to do it, they all said, this is good. I mean, yes, there were some people, notably President Bob Caslin, who probably would have preferred somebody who'd been in the head coaching chair before. And Billy Napier would have been a guy like that. But it's it's kind of how it went back in that Kentucky night. And Andy, you know this. In coaching searches, it's always how they get around it. They make one offer. They're only going to offer it one time, and it's to the guy they know who's going to say yes. So as I understand it, when they were finishing up their interview with Billy Napier, they liked what he had to say and said, you know, Billy, uh, we would like this. And, you know, if we were to ever consider you, would you be interested in this job? And Billy said, well, you know, we, we'd talk about it. We'd have to think about it. That's not a yes. It's not a no. But USC was like, oh, okay, um, we know. We'll be do, do, actually, actually, do you think there was some concern with Napier that it would be a situation like we saw with Tom uh, Herman back during the, after, the, after the Spurrier changeover? where he might have said yes, but let me also see what else is out there. Right. Um, if there's a I, yeah, I but scenario, then they knew. And I personally think that Billy Napier was like, well, you, you could have this job now, but there might be some other big jobs opening up very, very soon. And I think he might still be in play for a job that could be opening up after this week. We'll see. But I think they heard enough to know it's like, he's kind of hesitant and we got a guy who wants the job. And really that Saturday night, it was pretty much like, uh, as I understand it, Shane was in his office, his home office in Norman, Oklahoma. He saw Ray Tanner's name on his phone ID, picked it up and said, hello, Coach Tanner, what can I do for you? And Ray said, listen, Shane, uh, we've gone through it. And, well, we know that you're our guy. Would you? Yes. And they were, he knew it. And that, that was, it was done that quickly. They made one offer, and he's the one that accepted it. Actually, you t you know, David, you touched on on, on a, one of the questions from a question from one of our uh, folks who registered to uh, to be part of this event, Brad Wallace. And Brad's Thanks, question, man. Brad's Brad's question was actually this: Did Caslin really uh, want Billy Napier because he wanted a head coach who had been a head who had had the coaching experience, and was he really um, uh, demanding to have the last word on the hire just because he had hired obviously a successful coach uh, at Army well, when he was uh, like when he was a superintendent of West Point. Sure. It's like this, Brad. Um, he was always going to have the last word because he has to sign off on it. But this decision was Ray Tanner's. Yes, Bob Caslin had input. He was involved with the interviews and he did like Billy Napier. Ray Tanner liked Billy Napier. A lot of people did because he'd been there. He's a guy who knows the state. He played at Furman. He was assistant coach at SC State and Clemson. Uh, and he brings a lot to the table. But when it came down to deciding, they was like, well, you know, here's the positives and negatives of Beamer. Here's the positives and negatives of Napier. And Beamer won out. So it wasn't that Bob cast the final vote. He did have to sign off on it because he's the university president. But this search was led, conducted, and finished by Ray Tanner, and the others were uh, in an advisory role. Okay. Um, uh, Dana Coleman um, asks uh, this question. In your opinion, do you think that uh, Beamer will make a good CEO of the Gamecock football pro program? And do you have any information on who he's targeting for his coordinator spots? <laughs> How do I know we get that question? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of names out there that he's looking at for offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator because this hire is not going to be judged on just Shane Beamer. It's going to be judged on who he hires to help him out. So he set himself up in that CEO role. Uh, you know, of being kind of the head man in charge. Maybe he coordinates special teams, maybe not. But that's kind of beside the point to what's going to be offensive and defensive. So I think he's definitely set up to do that well. And I think that it helps him get into the head coaching position just because you have so much to deal with in that spot. And now if you get your two top assistants in there, you don't have to worry so much about designing all the play calls for offense, designing all the plays for defense. You can let those guys do it and you can chip in and oversee. So second part of your question, who are the coordinators? <laughs> There's a lot of names out there, but I would say 
Mike Bobo is already on staff. I would not discount him, uh, you know, if he does elect to stick around or is being asked to stick around. There's some other options that he could take. Uh, but there's some names out there. Garrett Riley, uh, Lincoln's brother, who's the OC at SMU, is a guy I've heard a lot about. And Jay Bateman, the defensive coordinator at North Carolina, is a guy I've heard a lot about. Also, I've heard the name Chad Staggs who's down at Coastal right now coordinating the defense for an 11-0 team. So it, it, there's still a, at least a week to go before they name it. They want to get some games up uh, under their belt from teams that are still playing, but those are two names I've heard. All right. Now, they, and obviously you answered the Bobo uh, uh, <clears throat> question in that. And Dana also asks, why do you think Muschamp failed? What, 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 what was, I mean, I mean, I mean what, what was the reason why he really couldn't, get that program get the program going again right and well I think there are a lot of ways to answer that and let's just go ahead and say it first one it's really hard to win here it's very hard to do it that's why there's mostly been outside of C Spurrier coaches who have had a good season or two but mostly nothing sustained it's very hard to sustain success at this school for whatever reason despite the fans the facilities and everything else they have going for them so that's part of it I think part of it too is that you never want to be the guy following the guy. Um, anytime you follow a legend, it's going to be tough. And no matter what you do, it's not going to be good enough because the other guy before you did it better. A third thing is that it's Will Muschamp. And when that hire was announced, it was, what? I mean, how, why? How can you possibly hire a guy who not only was fired from an SEC East school less than two years ago, but was fired the day after South Carolina beat his team. To me, that started him off with two strikes against him. And I'll admit, by the end of that second year, when they won nine games, I thought, okay, you know what? We were wrong. He learned, and it was a great hire. Well, you see what happened the two years after that. So yeah. I think the overall program is just that we'll try to run an NFL program. And there's nothing wrong with that because you see the guys that have progressed on to the next level. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you concentrate on the here and now first. And it seemed like they could get that out of the way before they started to run their NFL uh, dreams and their programs and, and kind of things like that. Certainly not saying that kids didn't care while they were here. They cared. They cared a lot. They loved right. Will, every one of them. But it just did not work out to where it's saying, look, you have to approach it this way to win in college and then you can approach it like an NFL system so a combination of all those things I mean again it's it's tough to win here it really is and you also look at the fact that by recruiting rankings he signed some pretty good classes but play development is a big part of winning in college football and you never really saw the guys who came in as stars leave as stars there were a few but there were mm -hmm. all a lot of guys like a DJ Wanham, a TJ Brunson, a guys who may not have come in with the biggest of hype, but they left as really good contributors, and now they're playing on Sundays. Exactly. They're doing, doing well. Um, let me uh, throw this one out from uh, Fred Edgerton, and also real quick before I get to this, uh, please feel free to uh, ask a question now. We, we, we will, we'll take a few, but these are from folks who uh, submitted them beforehand. Fred Edgerton asks, you know, what's the role of former players in, in, in this program, especially considering – uh, that they've uh, that they backed uh, backed Shane Beamer and all of this. I mean, are they going to be recruiting help? Is it more about social media cheerleading? Is it even maybe even some of them becoming assistant coaches? That could be an option about whether they become assistant coaches. That's just going to be a, a position of need. If they need to go that way, they'll definitely look at it. Obviously, Chris Rumpf, former player uh, on the CarQuest Bowl team back in '94. Um, you know, and, and now been all over uh, the SEC and now with the Houston Texans, he's a guy that could end up having a role on staff, but he's been a coach a lot of years before. So, you know, former players are just that. They want to, to be involved with the program. They want to be recognized for giving their time and their blood and sweat to this program. And sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. You know, under Steve Spurrier, it didn't happen a whole lot with the alums. It happened some. Under Will Muschamp, it happened a lot. 
You know, he said, you guys come on back. This is who we need on the sidelines and in practice to talk to these guys. You know, that's why the pictures are up there in the indoor practice facility and that kind of thing. So I would anticipate that to continue. Not only does Shane know all of those players from the, the time when it was really good from 10 to 13 when he helped recruit a bunch of those guys and they ended up winning 42 games over four years. Uh, and, you know, that will help. Um also, it never hurts to have your former players cheerleading for you on social media, showing up in their letter jackets, you know, saying, hey, I'm going cheering for my Gamecocks today. Uh, because, you know, these past few years, when things didn't go well, you saw a lot of lettermen saying the direct opposite, you know, cheering for Will Muschamp to be fired, saying that they couldn't stand watching the program. And people hear that. And most notably, recruits hear that. So when you have a guy like Alshon Jeffrey, a guy like Stefan Gilmore saying, man, we made the right hire. I love Coach Beamer. There's going to be a lot of kids who look at that and say, maybe I ought to take another look at South Carolina. So you're – so you having, 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 having the reigning NFL Defensive Player of the Year endorse you doesn't, doesn't hurt at all. Um, uh, uh, Wyman Hagler uh, asked a question that we got a couple of times from folks. You know, where does Connor Shaw fit in this picture? Do, is, is he part of the staff? Does he go to more of a support role? Where do you think he, he lands? Well, he's, he's part of the staff now. He's the quarterback's coach uh, through the bowl game if they get one, and they probably are going to get one. Uh, whether or not they play in it, we'll, we'll have to see throughout the next couple of weeks. Um, but I would anticipate him being in this program some way next year. He does want to continue coaching. I've confirmed that. Uh, but if there's not room for him to continue coaching next year, he would have no problem in stepping back into an off-the-field role, maybe as an analyst, maybe as to what he was doing before, which was director of player development and in charge of the Beyond Football program. So uh, Connor Shaw will be a part of this program going forward. The specific role has yet to be defined. I got you. All right, we have a question from, uh, from one of our viewers here on this webinar. And, and it's anonymous attendee. So I, I want to go ahead and give them a movie. You like movies. I want to go ahead and give, give this person a movie night. We're going to say it's H.I. McDonough has, uh, has given this question from my good, favorite good movie, Raising, Raising Arizona. Uh, and H.I. wants to know, what, if anything, will give Coach Beamer an edge in recruiting an in-state um, in state or elsewhere? What, what, what is it that, that, that maybe gives him a little bit, um, uh, you know, of a, of a, of a chance of, of being successful um, especially considering, as you said, he's not been a coordinator at this point. Well, winning games, but obviously we can't get to that for a while. So what's going to help him, I think, is that he can go and say, listen, you can look at the roster just like I can and see that most of the talented guys South Carolina had in 2020 are gone. They're not coming back. And you can look and see how bare bones this roster currently is. you got a chance to start from day one. Do you want to play? Do you want to play on national TV every week? Do you want to be in the best football conference in America every week? Come on down. You can do that right now. And I can promise you, you know, uh, if you're if you don't want to go somewhere and sit for three years and wait your turn to play while you get bigger and stronger, well, we want you to get bigger and stronger at USC too. But you're probably going to be able to play right away. So come be a, a, a part of something that's going to start. Come be a part of something that's going to really get better as you go along, and you're not going to have to wait your turn. Well, let me ask you this, um, and this, this, this question comes from Andy in Columbia, and he wants to know, and it's, I'm curious, you know, I, I read your article about signing day yesterday, eight players, seven defections. Um, um, well, at least at least they got signed more players than they, they had defected at this point. And, I, and we understand that this is sort of a fact of life. But, of course, the transfer portal is a lot different uh, with, the, with the transfer rules uh, in effect and the, and the eligibility rules in effect. So, first of all, talk a little bit about, I guess, what that bare bones, you know, what, 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 what recruiting will look like, what he has a chance to do. And also, because he's been at so many places, Virginia Tech, Georgia, Oklahoma, just to name a few, his, most, his three most recent stops, how does how does maybe does he work that transfer portal uh, in a way because he's had uh, he's been in so many places? Well, uh, Andy in Columbia, uh, he's going to have to. <laughs> right now, the Gamecocks just need bodies. Um, because of COVID, you can't recruit face to face. You can't get guys on your campus so you can talk to them and find out a little about what makes them tick. You're just going to have to look at their game film talk to their former coaches and say, you know, is this a good guy or should I steer clear? They're just going to have to take a lot of flyers on guys they normally wouldn't because they need bodies. They just don't have the talent right now or the, the full a filled roster so they can be afford to be selective. 
Uh, it was a little bit by design to only sign eight yesterday because you can only get 25. And the fact is, you don't want to just start filling up classes and getting guys that you might have to tell them later, hey, um, would you mind waiting a year before you come in? Because we made a mistake and we need to get this guy in better. So they have a lot of room on what they could do with their remaining scholarships. There is still the February signing period. Now, of course, with high school kids, there's probably not going to be a lot of great uncommitted players once you get to February. But the transfer portal is bigger than it's ever been right now. I believe I read a stat just last week that 190 players entered it in one week. There's got to be a few guys that can help there. And you have to just look at every one of them and say, do you want to come in here and help? Because right now they just need bodies, Andy. I mean, they've got to have yeah. somebody to fill that talent. And not that there aren't good, talented uh, kids on the roster that's coming back, but if you look at the guys that produced last year, Sha Smith, Ernest Jones, Sedarius Hutcherson, they're all leaving for the NFL. And that's fine. They should do that. You throw in J.C. Horn, Israel Mukiwamu, those guys are leaving too, and you think, hmm, who actually that did something well is coming back? You got Kevin Harris, and that's great. Right. Who's coming with him? Because there's not a lot of known names there. Right now. I, a couple of follow-ups on that. Number one, do you think that maybe Shane will bring maybe some Oklahoma kids with him? He knows that roster. I mean, please, it's a it's a national, it's a it's a playoff it's a playoff built roster, and if he knows a few of dissatisfied folks are in the portal, I can imagine. He might be bringing a couple, and then also, what's a realistic expectation for the Gamecocks next year? I mean, is a, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, you know, besides Vanderbilt, is there a game, and and Vanderbilt and the and the non and the uh, non conference games that they have? I mean, is, I mean, should we be ready for a rough season? I guess. Well, uh, the first part, you know, all's fair in love and recruiting. So I'm sure that there has been at least some dialogue saying, you know, if you're thinking about or, or looking to redshirt next year and not play in Oklahoma, maybe you could come over here and play some. Or if there are guys in the transfer portal right now, the rule is, Andy, as soon as your name pops up in that portal, everybody can contact you. So it's open season in that case. And I know that Shane has been in touch with a lot of guys already. I can't say if he's been in touch with any uh, Oklahoma players, um, but I'm sure I would not be surprised if a few guys who are wearing crimson and cream right now will be wearing garnet and black in the spring. We'll just have to see how it goes. As for your next question, it's, it's always been a stock line of mine of, you know, what's a realistic expectation for Gamecock football? Well, expectations and realism are two different things around here, okay? So I know you always say like, oh, can they get to a bowl game? Well, it's hard for me to say because – is the season going to be the same? Is it going to be a 12-game schedule? Are the uh, conference opponents going to be the same? Are the non-conference opponents going to be the same? Because looking at the non-conference opponents they have scheduled outside of Clemson, you think, no, oh, that's three wins right there. Okay. And then you got Vanderbilt on there. That should be another one. I mean, it's going to be at home too. But where else are the wins going to come from? So Really tough to say right now, but I would say just because of the roster, the way it looks right now, and knowing that it's not likely you're going to find a lot of great players in the transfer portal, it might be another pretty tough season. Three wins, four wins, who knows? But you just have to give these things time to say, well, you don't know what they're going to be able to do from the transfer portal from February, and you don't know what the season's going to look like either. I will say that just getting to – I guess late February and having a full 15 session spring practice will do wonders because, you know, injuries happen, but this team didn't look a lot, uh, you know, conditioned and ready to go this year. That's not the fault of the, uh, the strength staff. It's the fault that they had so many young guys who had to play and they didn't get a spring practice to prepare for it. Okay. Well, that, that pretty much wraps up our time here uh, uh, on this, uh, on this webinar or whatever the heck we want to call it, uh, fancy zoom call. Um, but about Gamecocks. But I, what I want to say is, you know, first of all, thank you for everyone who watched. And, um, and, and obviously, thank you if you're a subscriber to the Post and Courier. And if you're not a subscriber to the Post and Courier, we're running a, a holiday sale. Please check it out. You can get it at a, a little less than what it really cost uh, than the full price. It's a good deal. We're actually getting a lot of subscribers from that. Also, be sure to follow uh, uh, David on uh, postandcourier.com. We actually have slash Columbia for Columbia News, for USC News. So add that. Also, please uh, sign up for our newsletters. We have a news newsletter, a food newsletter, a weekend newsletter. Uh, we have two business newsletters. We have newsletters. 
I don't know. Maybe we need to get David to do a newsletter so we can throw we it in. We need to start a newsletter discussing why Die Hard is a Christmas movie. This has been yeah. the topic of great debate around Columbia lately, and I'm so disappointed to see that some USC administrators don't share that view, which don't worry. I'm going to talk to them, get them straightened out. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll send our best reporters on it, David. I'm, I'm, that's, that's something that we need to get cracking on. But please, again, thank you all for, uh, for watching today. Thank you uh, again, uh, David, for your time uh, and obviously all your good work. And uh, to everyone out there, have a great holiday. Have a great new year. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for reading.